Look at this, I'm gaming on a Samsung Galaxy Book and it's not even plugged in. This is one of the most exciting laptops I've reviewed in a long time. Can NVIDIA's brand new RTX 40 series of graphics cards, this gorgeous 16 inch 120Hz AMOLED display, and also the most oversized trackpad I have ever seen, make this the dream create laptop and want to properly rival the Dell XPS's, ZenBook Pros, and MacBook Pros of this world? Or do a few slightly annoying decisions and a few compromises, and also a pretty hefty price tag, actually make this one to miss? And could this be the first of a new breed of laptop, the gaming ultrabook? Well, before we get stuck in, if you do enjoy this video and find it useful, then a cheeky like and subscribe would be very much appreciated. And I also will leave links to this in the description below if you fancy checking it out. So the Book 3 Ultra, Samsung's fancy new top of the line laptop for 2023, and also their first with a dedicated graphics card. And they arrive alongside the Galaxy Book 3 Pro, which is lighter and more portable, but has lower power CPUs and also integrated graphics. But it is this Ultra that gets all the power and, as you would expect, the highest price as well. This starts at a hair under £2,500 or around $2,200. And for that, you get an RTX 4050, a 13th gen i7, 512 gigs of storage. Uh, this is also an Intel Evo certified laptop. And in its base configuration, it is about £250 less than a base MacBook Pro 16 with an M2 Pro, and I'll do a proper comparison of this later in the video. If you do want to max this out though, you can get a 4070, an i9 processor, and a terabyte of storage for around three grand. Now both CPU options, either the i7 or the i9, are 45 watt Intel 13th gen H series chips, meaning they're much more powerful than the usual P series that we get in smaller and lighter laptops. Beyond that, there is either 16 or 32 gigs of RAM, a fairly average size 76 watt hour battery, we get Wi-Fi 6E, a fingerprint reader, a very impressive 1080p webcam, and also some pretty decent quad speakers. However, straight away, there's a bit of a problem because with the top spec version, here in the UK at least, it tops out with 16 gigs of RAM, which with a 4070 and an i9, is ridiculous, it's a deal breaker. In the US, they have updated the store to uh, show a 32 gig version skew of this because the worst part is it's soldered on memory, you can't get it yourself. And if you are gonna go for a top spec model, you need at least 32 gigs of RAM. I mean, my MacBook Pro has up to 96 gigs, the Dell XPS 17 is 64. It's a very strange choice. And so I think unless they do add a 32 gig option or skew here in the UK and other regions, I would avoid the higher spec version of this. It just doesn't make sense. I think it'd be a bottleneck. But the entry level model with the 4050 and the i7 and 16 gigs of RAM, I think is still definitely worth considering. In better news, this gets NVIDIA's 4050 and 4070 GPUs. Now I've got the top dog here with all of its 4,608 CUDA cores, its eight gigs of GDR6 VRAM, and also its 60 watt TGP, which makes it kind of a mid-level model for this GPU. And while you do get far, far higher frame rates in your games and performance in your applications compared to an integrated XE chip like we get in its less beefy brother, the Galaxy Book 3 Pro. As you would expect for this form factor, it doesn't really compete with like a proper gaming laptop. In fact, even versus a last gen RTX 3070 Ti mobile GPU, this 4070 has 28% fewer CUDA cores, its memory bus is only half as wide, and we also get a lot less bandwidth. So with this, we're trading some of that raw power for much greater portability. Let's talk about this screen because it is a whopper of an upgrade over the previous Galaxy Books, which were always pretty good. And I love the fact that Samsung gave us AMOLED displays, uh, but they were always stuck to 60 Hertz and 16 by nine, which made them feel a bit dated. I am very happy to report that not only do we get a better AMOLED panel this time around, but it's also 16 by 10 and 120 Hertz. So everything feels so much faster. This is the kind of screen we should be getting on a laptop like this. And Samsung reckon their new dynamic AMOLED 2X panel is brighter with better HDR and more accurate colors. The 3K resolution is nice and sharp and it's kind of like a halfway house between Quad HD Plus and 4K. So it's a good balance for battery and performance and very similar to what you get on the MacBook Pro. But of course, it's not ideal if you do want to watch or edit 4K natively. And it's also very, very glossy. This picks up every reflection in the room and you could literally read my script for me through the laptop reflection there. Color accuracy though is fantastic. I measured 100% sRGB, 95% Adobe RGB, and 99% DCI P3, which makes this ideal for graphics artists, designers, and anyone doing color sensitive work. 
Brightness is also impressive, and in fact, I measured a much higher max brightness than even Samsung claims. I recorded around 530 nits in SDR and 740 in HDR. It also hits the Display HDR 500 True Black standard, and HDR content in particular looks incredible on this. This is an absolutely standout display. Build quality is also top notch as well. We have this aluminium chassis, there's no flex or anything. Uh, it's really well made laptop and of course incredibly thin and light given the performance and also the 16 inch screen size. Now you can open it with one finger which adds to that premium -ness a little bit and that is as far as the screen goes back. Although you'll notice we do get quite a bit of screen wobble. Not ideal. And actually, if I just sort of put it into a comfortable viewing position and then sort of pick it up and let's pretend I'm on a train or a plane, there's a bit of shaking. It is, that screen wobble is a bit annoying, I have to say. And it does eventually start pushing the screen down as well. So a beefier hinge would have been nice to see. Also, I'm sure Samsung are compensating for something because look at the size of that trackpad. It is massive and it's very nice to use. The problem is it kind of just squashes the keyboard up a little bit. We have these tiny, tiny arrow keys, these shortened function row keys. There is room for a numpad on the side, which is nice. I would have preferred if they just made this a bit smaller, but then expanded the keyboard a little bit. And also the keys aren't really my favorite. There's a sort of very rubbery softness to them, which isn't particularly satisfying. Perfectly fine, just not one of my favorite keyboards but no complaints about the size of this thing. It's just 1.79 kilograms or a hair under four pounds, which for a 16 inch laptop with these specs is very impressive. Although if portability is your top priority, then you should definitely consider its smaller 14 inch brother. As for connectivity, we have dual Thunderbolt 4 USB-Cs, one USB-A 3.2, a micro SD card reader, audio jack and HDMI 2 port. Again, it's just one of those frustrations. Given the price of this thing and also its target audience with these specs, you really would expect an HDMI 2.1 port uh, and also a full size SD. So that is a bit of a shame. I guess they were just prioritizing keeping it as thin as possible. On the inside, we have this vapor chamber cooler, dual fans, and also the PCIe 4 SSD is upgradable. There's also a second SSD slot, so lots of potential for upgrading the storage, but not the RAM. And then we also have this 76 watt hour battery. And speaking of battery, I'm getting around seven to eight hours of general light use and maybe like an hour and a half of gaming using the GPU without the power. Keep in mind though that all gaming potential is pretty dependent on being plugged in. On battery, Cyberpunk can times by performance dropped to around 45% and I lost close to 80% of my FPS in Siege, taking it from well over 100 to just over 30 FPS. Ouch. You will of course get the best performance plugged in and actually I should say it is just this USB-C cable. There is no big power adapter or brick that you have to lug around with you. Uh, it's a hundred watt charging. So in 90 minutes, I believe you can go from zero to a hundred. And of course being USB-C, you can charge your phone with it as well. Well, as long as you haven't got an iPhone. But the next question is just how fast is this thing? Well, firing up a bit of Premiere Pro and opening my 4K project, everything was nice and fast, even with processing effects and color correction. And of course, in any 3D apps like Blender or of course gaming, having this 4050 or in my case 4070 makes all the difference. For example, in F122 at Quad HD, I maxed out this 120Hz panel using medium settings and I got around 80 FPS at Ultra. Of course, ray tracing does tank that figure considerably, although frame generation, Nvidia's new frame interpolation tech, which is exclusive to these new 40 series cards, definitely helped to boost the FPS. In Cyberpunk, which is still a hugely demanding title, you can actually max out the settings with ray tracing and still get 43 FPS at QHD plus with DLSS at the performance. Drop to high settings without RT and with DLSS, and this will manage just over 100 frames per second. In Forza Horizon 5, I hit a solid 60 on medium to high settings and low 40s with everything cranked to the extreme. And then in my old benchmarking favorite, Rainbow Six Siege, the Samsung hit a super smooth 144 FPS with DLSS set to balanced. And just as importantly, the Book 3 Ultra performed well in the Time Spy frame stability stress test, meaning that there was really hardly any GPU throttling. And so I think that vapor chamber and the dual fans are doing a really good job here. And most of the time it's basically silent, really only if you're running sustained loads or gaming do you hear that fan wire up. And you do have different fan profiles and performance profiles within the uh, Samsung settings as well, which you can tinker with. But compared to some of its Windows rivals, the fans, the cooling, the temps, and also the performance, particularly on battery life, is all very impressive. And as for sound quality, the Quad AKG tuned speakers, and they get decently loud and clear, and importantly, they don't sound tinny. 
So this is being recorded on the webcam as I let the screen settle and stop shaking. TNTP video, and actually the quality is really nice. One of the better webcams I've tested. We are in studio lighting here. You can see my little inception going on there. Let me know how it sounds as well. This is using the built-in speakers. Speakers? Microphones. I do quite like that we get a few extra little uh, tools to play with. We have the eye contact mode, uh, which is supposed to make your eyes always appear to be looking at the camera. We've got background blur, we've got auto framing. So lots of nice like Samsung extras to improve the webcam. Although bizarrely, this webcam, this camera up here does not support Windows Hello for face unlocking. You have to rely on the fingerprint reader. What a boring behind the scenes. <laughs> The other advantage of going for this, a Samsung device, is we get extra connectivity and smart features with other Galaxy devices. For example, multi-control lets you share your mouse and keyboard with your Galaxy S series phone or tablet. We get instant hotspot. You can make it where your Galaxy phone automatically transfers raw photos directly to the laptop. And there's also quick share, which is basically the Samsung Galaxy version of Apple's AirDrop. Last question, how does this compare to this? Because if you're gonna spend like 2,500 pounds, then you're already firmly in the ballpark of a new MacBook Pro 16 with an M2 Pro. This does cost about 250 pounds more in its base spec compared to this, both with 512 storage, both with 16 gigs of RAM, uh, but an i7, 13th gen versus an M2 Pro. Now for some people, this is a completely pointless and academic comparison because you either go for one or the other because you want Mac OS or Windows 11, and that's completely fair enough. In my experience, generally, the MacBook Pro M2 is faster, it's quieter under load, and the big one for me is you get the exact same peak performance whether you're on battery or connected to the power. We get HDMI 2.1, more Thunderbolt 4 ports, a full-size SD, better speakers, a better webcam, in my opinion, a better keyboard and trackpad, and also a brighter screen with thinner bezels, although I know a lot of people don't really like this notch. As for the Samsung, well, it is very impressive by Windows laptop standards, particularly in terms of performance, also on battery life. It stays cool and reasonably quiet. The build quality is certainly up to Apple's standards. And the AMOLED screen, while not quite as bright, does win in terms of having higher contrast and deeper blacks. Although the MacBook's mini LED isn't that far behind. I know these Windows versus Mac comparisons can be quite controversial, but frankly, I don't care. I just use one of the best tech is at that moment in time. For me and my use cases, it's a clear win for MacBook Pro 16. But if you want Windows, if you want to play proper games and not just stream them over the cloud or play Apple Arcade, or you really want the performance of the 4050 or 4070, then this is definitely still worth considering. Okay, let's wrap this up. And the Galaxy Book 3 Ultra is a very capable, thin and light, semi-workstation laptop. I think there's a lot of strong competition out there, and I do have a few issues. The screen's a little wobbly, there's no full-size SD, no HDMI 2.1, the keyboard isn't my favorite, and the lack of a 32 gig RAM option on the highest spec, at least for now, is just baffling, to be honest. But aside from that, performance is good, battery life is decent, uh, the webcam's fantastic, I think the build quality generally is really nice, the thermals are good, I like the trackpad, but it is worth bearing in mind that this is a whole lot lighter than your MacBook Pro 16s or Dell XPS 17s of the world. So in terms of that pursuit of performance and portability, maybe Samsung's cracked it. I think my recommendation would be to stick with the base option of this, the i7, the 4050, uh, with 16 gigs of RAM. But what do you reckon? If you've got two and a half grand burning a hole in your pocket, would you be tempted by this? Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you next time right here on The Tech Chat.